This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Prijesh Amanath. Our guest today is Jackson Rep. Jackson is the CTO and Head of Marketing for HarperDB. He has over 25 years of experience architecting, designing, and developing enterprise software. He's the founder of three technology startups and has consulted with multiple Fortune 500 companies on IoT, that's Internet of Things, and digital transformation initiatives. Jackson, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. In today's session, we will talk about distributed data infrastructure, understand what it is, benefits of using it, the challenges which are unique to it. We will deep dive into the architecture and design patterns of distributed data infrastructure and also delve into security considerations. Finally, we will look at what one should consider while transitioning into a distributed data infrastructure setup. So let's start with the fundamentals. Jackson, can you help explain to our listeners the fundamental concept of distributed data infrastructure and why it's important? Absolutely. There are a few reasons why one would want to set up one's data infrastructure in a way that data does not live in a single location. The old adage was that I want to be more resilient. A data center might go down. So if it does, I don't want my entire application to fail. I would like to be able to route to a different place where the data is able to be served and my application can continue to function. That is what we have sort of dealt with for years and years. And there's lots of rules and tools around setting up a distributed data infrastructure, mostly for resilience. And that includes things like disaster recovery, you know, a site that's very far away that eventually gets that data. I may not access it, so it doesn't need to be very particularly fast. But if all of my main office buildings burn down, I still need that data. So I need it to be and exist somewhere. More recently, it has been a challenge of scale, i.e. I have so many users that are trying to interact with my data that having a single database answer those questions or accept those inserts is not sufficient. Or if it is, I'm spending a lot of money to put a terabyte of RAM and multiple cores in a machine so that it can perform at a level that is satisfactory for my users when they're trying to interact with that data. If I am in many locations, obviously I divide up that user base and the resource requirements for each node of my data infrastructure are lower. It introduces other challenges though. However, the most recent reason, and this is, I don't think it's entirely pandemic driven, but before the pandemic, sub 50 millisecond response times for APIs were not something everybody was demanding. We rarely heard about it. High performance applications, absolutely. But for most people, it was, you know, get it to me within half a second, 500 milliseconds, and that's fine. And when everybody started working from home, everybody got real impatient for apps that were slow. And the newest reason we have distributed data infrastructure and the one that sort of drives my company and companies like us is the idea of extremely low latency. So not only am I distributing the load across multiple data ingest points or access points for queries, and not only am I resilient and not only am I protected in case of a disaster, but also I am closer to the user. So I am lowering the latency for that response or for that insert. So it's really a combination of latency, cost, resiliency, and ultimately the whole balance of that is complexity because obviously we keep adding moving parts to a system. It gets more and more complex. Yeah, all of that makes sense. So resiliency, scale, low latency, all of that is very critical and important for you know any business that's out there on the net right now. But circling back to the fundamental concept, what is data? When we say it's a distributed data infrastructure, what does that mean? It means that I'm going to store data in more than one place. The idea that I may divide my data into multiple servers. I may divide my data across multiple regions. I may replicate my data in whole or in part across multiple regions. So traditional sharding divides up very large data sets across multiple servers, keeps track of where each piece of data is, and allows you to access it. So that's the basic level of putting data in more than one place. When I talk about distributed data infrastructure, 
I mean, your data is accessible in whole or in part in many different locations around, let's say, the globe or it may be around your service area. But distributed data infrastructure are the servers and the connections and the software that allows you to access data as if it was sitting on your laptop as quickly as possible, even though it may be located in multiple places in the world. Understood. And why is it called data infrastructure? Is it same as distributed databases? Or when you say it's distributed data infrastructure, Are you taking a different view of what the stack is and does it include additional components and layers? Well, infrastructure requires obviously hardware, the servers to run it, the software that is going to store your data. And when you have distributed data, you need some way for those independent nodes, those independent servers to speak to each other. So there's tooling around how those nodes communicate, how a transaction that happens on one server is replicated and reconciled on a different server where a similar transaction might have just happened to affect the exact same record. So the tooling and systems to make sure that everything in an end state is what should have happened based on you know the time at which it happened anywhere in the world is complex and requires a lot of individual parts. So I refer to infrastructure as a combination of software and hardware. And not just databases, but all the tooling around it that allow you to break them out and have them live more than one place. Right. So in my mind, it's much more comprehensive than just a distributed database because it includes not just the database, but it includes the processing, it includes the engines, the integration tools, and all of that is combined under the umbrella term data, distributed data infrastructure. Absolutely. When you think about what you're really trying to achieve, extremely low latency for users that are dispersed around the planet, there's a lot of tooling that not only goes into just storing the data and making sure that this entity that covers the planet has your data and is readily accessible, but there's also a lot of tooling to make sure that people can push data in, in a way, or get data out in a way that fits with their end use. So there's also lots of software involved in making it easy. We often refer to distributed data infrastructure as a data fabric. There's a lot of work that goes into making a weave. There's lots of different sorts of fibers that go into it. But the objective is to provide a uniform surface from which and to which you know data can flow. Understood. And are there any specific considerations which are required for distributed data infrastructure to be optimized for IoT applications? Yes. I think one of the oft-cited statistics is that we're going to have several trillion devices you know, generating information. And where that information ends up, whether it's just fired off, not collected, and it exists in the ether, and that device just measures something, and every once in a while you go over and just look at the current value. That's a perfectly good sensor, and walking across the room and looking at it is a perfectly good way to manage it. If I've got several hundred under my domain or several hundred thousand for, say, a large manufacturing concern, then really what you're looking at is how can I handle that level of throughput? How can I handle it securely? How can I reconcile that if they are doing ingest into different nodes, different servers, different databases in different parts of the planet. How do I leave those together? How do I make sure that I reconcile them in time? So are my clocks aligned? Things like that. There's a lot of concerns when you're talking about distributed data infrastructure that are absolutely table stakes in order to be able to say, I trust that if somebody in Mumbai puts a piece of data into this server, that somebody in Los Angeles, when they ask for a question of my server, will get the right answer that includes the data that was just inserted you know, on the other side of the planet. True. We touched on the benefits, but I want to double click on some of the benefits that you mentioned earlier. So data availability is crucial for businesses. How does distributing data across geographical locations on nodes contribute to improve data availability? And how does that all sync up together? You can imagine, and we can go back to the IoT use case, when I have hundreds of thousands of sensors producing data, I may be looking at 
temperature and I might be looking at vibration and I might be looking at any number of parameters that are coming off that machine that I'm measuring. And if I ingest that all off of hundreds of thousands of machines that are creating that data every five milliseconds, that is a tremendous amount of ingress. And when I have all of that data, the availability of it depends on what my use case is. If I'm just trying to create a dashboard that tells me the current value of, you know, what's the current temperature of that machine? Is it too hot? Do I need to turn it off for a while? Do I need to increase cooling? Is it about to fail? Do I need to do preventative maintenance? Do I need to, I don't know, change the oil? Then that's easy. I could just look at that. But if I wanted to allow intelligent systems to look at data, to look at patterns in that data, say machine learning, right? AI, looking at every single reading off of every single sensor attached to every single machine, and also considering other external factors like the temperature and humidity in the environment in each location of my factory. I often call it the Rumsfeldian challenge, right? I don't know what I don't know. So the safest method often is to default to collecting absolutely everything so that what truly needs to be available for my enterprise, what truly can make a difference, what truly can improve my performance, profitability, resiliency is in there somewhere. And we are very, very quickly getting to a place where distributed data infrastructure is a tool for very quickly collecting and returning, but also analyzing all of that data in a way that perhaps humans can't even do anymore. So having a platform that accesses data, when we talk about availability from a data system, you're often talking about somebody typing in a SQL query and asking it a question or you know, a customer coming in and hitting an API endpoint that asks a question and gets that back. Even at the peak volumes of hundreds of thousands of requests a second for some of the largest networks in the world, that's fine. That's, we can do that with existing infrastructure today. But when you talk about a machine learning algorithm that needs or is capable of processing things hundreds of thousands of times faster than that, because what they really want to do is recognize a pattern and perhaps turn off a machine before it blows up and kills people or you know, in some people's eyes, even worse, loses productivity for a day, you know, at a million dollars an hour. That's what availability is becoming. It's not just what you and I are going to look at and be able to comprehend. It's what machines are going to look at. And the depth and breadth of what they can look at is several orders of magnitude, obviously, what we can do. And that's where the industry is going. So while we say low latency for users and API endpoints or ingest from lots of users that are maybe adding comments on a YouTube blog, that's really, really small scale compared to what we're seeing in industry today. And so infrastructure needs to be able to handle that. And that's what we are building tooling for. That's what truly distributed data infrastructure is great at. Do you have any specific examples where, you know, any of your customers have benefited from implementing distributed data Infrastructure, I think it will really help bring those points around resiliency, scalability, low latency to life. Absolutely. I've worked on an IoT platform in a former life, and we were effectively sensorizing hot dip galvanizing plant, which is where you take the steel poles that hold up Mm -hmm. road signs. Like literally everything is hot dip galvanized in the world so that the steel doesn't rust. And That process was incredibly manual. And the people who dip each of these massive pieces of metal in, you know, three chemical ponds and then in a pool of molten nickel were treating it like it was an art. Now, the reality is the system required or the the legal requirements for any given, you know, road sign holding piece of metal have a certain thickness of zinc that you need to put on there in order to guarantee that it won't rust and it will withstand whatever element and whatever environment it's put in. And treating it like an art didn't seem right because what humans would do would prefer to never put too little on so they don't have to redo it. And Mm -hmm. as a result, they were putting way more zinc on this metal than they needed to. And that was the primary cost center for this business. So we built a system where we could sensorize it and we could say it was in this tank for this long, this tank for this long, this tank for this long. Then we dipped it in the zinc and the operator left it this long. Then we measured how thick it was versus how thick it was supposed to be. And we said, 
we're going to put a green light right in front of you. And I know you think it's an art when you take it out, but take it out when the green light is there. I promise you, we've already done the work. We've analyzed not only the length of time and the mil spec of how thick that zinc was, but we've also analyzed all the external factors like weather, temperature, humidity. And when that light turns green, pull it out of that tank. And sure enough, we were meeting the mil spec required and we were using 30% of the raw materials that we were using before. So that's a 70% increase in efficiency. And we did that project in a few weeks because humans are really terrible at judging objectively chemical processes that science and measurement and tooling is much better at. And in order to be able to make that calculation as to when that light turns green, we needed all of the data from all of the tanks and all of the external factors. And we needed a system that could also respond and have output that said, hey, you're done. Turn on the green light and tell that guy to take that out of that tank. As a result, profits jumped and the customer was extremely happy. Very interesting example. And help me understand the scale of the operation, which needed a distributed data infrastructure and a traditional relational database would not have worked over here. So it needed to be able to store the data locally because the other thing that's extremely true about hot dip galvanizing is it's an incredibly dirty process and it doesn't happen anywhere where humans are. So it often doesn't happen anywhere where there's really good network connectivity and it happens across Mm -hmm. massive yards. So the measurement of that mill spec doesn't happen next to the shed, but the shed usually isn't super close to the office either in case there's an industrial accident. So there's lots of failures in network connectivity. So you need to work locally. So you need to be able to store that somewhere. And then when network connectivity is restored, which it does sporadically, you need to be able to move that data into the central location because looking at it locally only gives me, you know, one, two, maybe a hundred pieces a day, but I need enough data to tell you exactly what environmental factors, exactly what temperatures each of the tanks are at to be able to build an algorithm that will tell me to take it out at the right time, no matter where I am across the country. So in essence, what we did is we were recording the data locally. We were employing an algorithm that ultimately told you to turn the light on, but the algorithm was a product of all of the aggregate data across all of the individual facilities where this process was happening. Right. Understood. So I guess This is an example of known unknowns being translated into known knowns and then having an implementation which analyzed it and changed an art form into a highly mechanical form. Absolutely. That's exactly it. We took raw data and we turned it into human action. Excellent. Let's move on to the challenges. So what are some of the challenges that organizations face or might face when implementing a distributed data infrastructure? And if you've got an example to walk us through those challenges that any of your clients have faced or, you know, while you have been consulting or in your current role where you have experienced clients implementing a distributed data infrastructure, what were the challenges they faced that would help bring it to life as well? It's a great question because the challenges are different every time. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we've learned at HarperDB as we go into different organizations to help them improve performance and resiliency and all of the benefits is understanding exactly what their topology, right? Where their servers should live, what their servers need to accomplish, what is the load and what is the necessity for availability? And ultimately, what is the scale of that data? I think most industries, most clients have a certain amount of data that they are used to dealing with. And when you start to tell them that there are insights right? The, the unknown unknowns that they could capture and optimize from, maybe not today, but in the future, the planning of that topology and that infrastructure, including where I am today and the path to get to, you know, the end result, that's the biggest challenge because for most customers, they can't afford to shut down their entire data infrastructure and migration feels like a multi-year task. So the opportunity is to provide them an infrastructure where it's not rip and replace. They don't have to tear things out. They want to extend their existing system with distributed data infrastructure that delivers all of the benefits. And the challenges are, how do we keep your existing system functional? 
as functional as possible while delivering those benefits out on the edge. Specifically, we talk about, you know, the observability is super hot right now. It's the hottest trend. Everybody wants so many statistics about their systems operating status, primarily to optimize, to make sure things don't go wrong because data infrastructure is so critical. But when we are doing that, we look at what's truly happening in your data pipeline. So for requests, say, how many layers of caching are there? What is the response time for every single layer of that cache? What are your cache hit and miss rates? How can we optimize that? We're working with a specific customer right now who has 600 million SKUs, and they are trying to manage the availability of those. And obviously, you don't want to serve every single one of those from a database in real time. You want to cache as many of those responses as you can. So how do you cache them? How do you decide what gets cached, what remains cached, what gets evicted if I run out of room because servers do have limitations? And how do I optimize this? Because it might not be the same in every location. So my rules for evicting things from a cache, my rules for partitioning data and moving a record perhaps somewhere else are wholly determined based on the user behavior in that particular region. So helping them plan and understand that moving data is a natural part of a distributed system, as opposed to, you know, the current thinking, which is my database lives right over there. And that's where all my data is. So getting customers used to the idea that sometimes the machine or the system or the algorithm or the AI is going to make decisions that maybe your human engineer wouldn't do. And your human engineer will say, I don't know why that record isn't in cache because I just hit it and it came back as a cache miss. I just hit it and it came back with, it had to access disk instead of you know being pulled from the RAM. Why is that? And in many times we investigate and we're like, well, because you're literally the only person hitting that particular endpoint, asking for that particular item. And it's their favorite item. It's the item they always test with, but it has fallen out of favor because there is a newer model or everybody else in the world is looking for a different version now. So helping them understand how the rules are often optimized, not by humans, but by machines. And another great example is the idea of database admins who like to look at query plans and optimize queries by hand. That is their job. That is what they've been doing for 30 years, 40 years. So they know exactly how to do it. They work really, really well with antiquated databases. I won't say antiquated, but just enterprise scale databases that have been running for over a decade. And they know every toggle that they can handle. And it's hard to help them understand that modern systems can toggle those things on and off and reorder and optimize queries far better, far faster, and in real time than a human can do it. So helping them understand that modern software isn't trying to take their job. There's lots of complexities that comes with a distributed data infrastructure. It's just how do you help them understand their new role as a manager of a distributed data system as opposed to a database, i.e. singular database administrator. Right. So if I understand it correctly, it's the challenges are more around changing the viewpoint of technologists from the traditional centralized database to understanding the complexities around optimization and rule-based usage, which are driven differently in a distributed data infrastructure. Is that right? It is. It's also understanding the limits of a distributed data system. Mm -hmm. And there's a mathematical theorem called the CAP theorem that says you can have consistency, availability, and partitioning, but you can only have two. Right. The three legged stool says you cannot divide your data across multiple instances and have it be available if you want it to be exactly the same all the time, i.e. consistent. Mm -hmm. So I cannot have two nodes on opposite sides of the planet that are always on and ready to answer questions. If I also want the second I put in data on one side of the planet at the very same millisecond or, you know, a nanosecond after, I want to ask that question. I want to ask that question on the other side of the planet and get the answer reflective of the data you just put in because it takes time. It takes time for data to move across the planet. In our most optimized systems, you know, we've seen 75 milliseconds to replicate an insert around the planet to 100 nodes. So it's super fast, but it's not instant. And that theorem 
puts limitations on what truly distributed infrastructure can do. You could either lock the row, which means that it's not going to be available to everybody while I am writing it globally, and then you don't have availability. You could have a single database, which means I don't have partitioning, or I could accept that I will be what we call eventually consistent. And again, eventually means perhaps 75 milliseconds, but I wouldn't want to have a banking app where I could take a dollar out of an account that has $1 in it, and you could do the same thing on the other side of the planet at the exact same nanosecond. That feels like a very bad way to run a bank. Thanks. So so from a distributed perspective, I guess the primary contention would be around the availability in the cap theorem. Yes. And you can choose, right? There are absolutely products that let's accept that in a distributed data system, everything is partitioned because we have more than one node. There are products in the marketplace, CockroachDB is one that does global row locking and has global consistency, right? They are asset compliant across the cluster. That is a totally acceptable paradigm, but you sacrifice performance because not everybody can write to a row while that row is locked. So as a result, you know, performance may be lower, but you get that asset consistency worldwide. My company, HarperDB, we focus on availability. So we are eventually consistent. We work really hard to make sure that our paths between nodes are optimized and we can lower that latency, you know, as low as 75 milliseconds or less between those nodes to reconcile a transaction. But we can't have both. Right. Can you explain to our users what does eventual consistency mean? Eventual consistency means that Let's say I have two nodes, one in Los Angeles and one in London, and I'll be writing to a table. I will be asking it questions, and that will be happening in on both servers. If I insert a record, a new blog post, I put that in there. And consistency would mean that if somebody in London or somebody hitting the London server asks for all of my blog posts, they would see all of my blog posts, including the one I just put in there just literally a nanosecond ago. It just got committed to disk. The transaction is complete. And they say, give me all this blog post right then. And it will appear. Mm -hmm. And that is consistency in an acid compliant way, right? Eventual consistency means that I will write it, but it might not be immediately available, i.e. consistent in London, because it takes time for that data to move over there. The way you achieve consistency or acid compliance, right? That consistency on a global scale is for me to have the London server, basically when I insert the data into Los Angeles, the first thing I do is say, I'm going to change this row or I'm going to put a new row in, you know, lock this row and don't let anybody read it because I am going to change it. So they may wait 75 milliseconds. So the database query might be slow, right? Because it's waiting for that to be done. And ultimately that is the trade-off that we make. So the idea that For a real-time system, which most often is user behavior, it is sensor data, it is, you know, lots of analytics that are coming in. Is it really super important? Is it critical? Will people lose money if it's not available the second it's committed to disk everywhere? Because if it is super critical that it's available everywhere, think again, banking transaction, then really the model is to either have global row locking or to have a single monolithic database that I write to that, of course, locks that row while other people are like piling in on it, even from London. But then their latency is high because where does that database live? If it just lives in Los Angeles, then people on the other side of the planet have a lesser user experience or higher latency while they're trying to access data. So we tend to focus at HarperDB on on making it as fast and performant as possible for ingest and reads. And we sacrifice consistency in order to achieve that. Perfect. Clearly understood. We'll move on to the next topic, which is around security. Security is a top concern when it comes to data. And what are the unique challenges faced in a distributed data infrastructure setup from a security perspective? Well, right off the bat, it is very similar to any network. But we can start with the database aspect of it in that the database needs to be secured in exactly the same way a normal monolithic database needs to be secured, right? all the ports, access control, you know, roles and users, and the ability to determine what people are allowed to access, let's say, what databases or what tables 
or even in the case of our product, what attributes? So think of it as column level security. So your select star with your mm-hmm. role might be different than my select star. My select star might bring back everything and yours brings back everything except the PII, the personally identifiable information. So, so normal database considerations as to how people can access this data and whether or not it's encrypted on disk and whether or not we want to do that based on the trade-off in, in terms of latency. Because obviously, in order for me to search stuff and return stuff that's encrypted, there's encryption and decryption, and it just adds to that time. So there's lots of standard database security things that you need to consider. And then in a distributed data system, you also need to consider the security of the communication between those instances of that database. So what sort of resiliency do you have? You know, what sort of encryption as the data travels across, right? So at the very minimum, TLS, sometimes MTLS, the idea that things need to be absolutely secure in flight so that you can't have somebody listening in the middle and intercepting that data because obviously it's not sitting in one place anymore. It moves around constantly. So there's the security of the channel itself, the security of network access to hardware, obviously, but then there's the security of the actual transmission of those messages. And I I would say less security than assurance. Can I handle a network outage? Can I route around it? Can I handle the fact that I might have data that I just put into Los Angeles server that needs to be in London, but somehow that network connection I cannot peer-to-peer connect to it. So how do I intelligently understand all the routes that are available to me, understand that the data needs to get there, and publish it to that server in such a way that it still gets there? That may mean rerouting it. That may mean publishing it to a different server that then forwards it on to Los Angeles or to London. It may mean storing it and retrying it. And it may mean that I want to have an exactly once delivery, i.e. I send it and I get an ACK back so I know that it's been received, at which point I'm like, that one's taken care of. Let's move on to the next one. Or do I want to, am I okay if if something that gets put into this database, say a sensor data chunk, obviously ACKing back for every transfer of data takes time. It slows down the rate of transmission. So if for raw sensor data that I can afford to miss one or two readings because I'm collecting them every five milliseconds is okay, if missing some of that is okay, then maybe I just fire and forget. Maybe I just fire it off and say, I hope it gets there. Maybe I fire it off three times, figuring my failure rate is so low that if I fire it three times, at least once it's going to get there. So on the other side, how do I recognize that I've already received that message and not accept it more than once? Because If I don't protect myself against that, then perhaps somebody could literally spam me and DDoS my system to death. So there's lots of rules around both the database storage, the instance itself, the communication between the system. And then when you're looking at a distributed data infrastructure, what you're not actually doing is saying, I'm going to talk to the Los Angeles server. I'm going to talk to the London server. You are going to talk to a single endpoint and you are going to put data in and you need intelligent routing to make sure that that actually gets into the system. So, you know, global DNS-based load balancing security products for DDoS in front of that, and, you know, lots of the big network, you know, services that are traditionally employed in every network are super important for distributed systems because if I'm able to get in in a way that is malicious, you risk not just taking down one of your databases, which happens to people, you know, fairly frequently, but you risk taking down a whole network of servers. So you've already sold in perhaps a solution that guarantees sub 25 millisecond response times globally. And because your distributed system has in some way been compromised, not only aren't they getting the extremely low latency that they are counting on probably for downstream systems that look for data at a certain rate so that they can make intelligent decisions in real time, now the whole network's down. So now that system is going to back up and there's going to be errors everywhere. So, you know, the other part of this is what we can control for is the managed service network that we set up, but we can also extend that data fabric sometimes on-prem where we don't control the infrastructure, right? It's the network closet down the hall and it has a massive hard drive and it's where you're running the really big analytical queries because it's just faster. You want it in-house. Somebody decided that it was a good idea not to move to the cloud for this because it would be too slow, 
right? Too far away because I need, I need sub millisecond response times. So when I can't control for that, how do I recognize patterns coming from something outside my managed infrastructure that are indicative of something that is wrong or incorrect, poorly shaped, or even malevolent? Right. Now we'll move into the, dig a bit deeper into the architecture and move to the architecture section. I appreciate, you know, as you give examples in this section, you might touch on the product that the Harper DB product that you're currently working with. So feel free to give examples from there as well in terms of how we have solved problems around architecture in Harper DB. Let me start with asking, you know, we, we know that NoSQL databases are inherently not asset compliant. So the asset, which stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And the usual approach to solve for us for this is to use multi-model databases. Can you start off by explaining what are multi-model databases? Multi-model databases store data in multiple formats in order to achieve multiple goals. So the idea, if your listeners are familiar with like a row-based versus column-oriented database, each has advantages. Time series database, which has processes that create aggregates, right? I don't want to run an, you know, tell me what happened the average every 15 minutes across a time series database. So you may store it in a different way so that you have very quick access to aggregates. You may store it in row if you are often returning, you know, individual entries, like this is my blog post. You may store it column oriented if you are looking at things from an analytical perspective. There are lots of ways to store things and often you store them in multiple ways based on multiple uses. HarperDB, our product is a single model database, and we are asset compliant at the node level. We are a NoSQL solution, but we have SQL semantics on top of it because we find that lots of customers are super used to SQL and they want to join things. So one of the challenges with one of the most popular NoSQL databases is that you can't do joins. You have to pull the records and do that in code, and ultimately that's far slower. So the way we have attacked you know, consistency is we absolutely are asset compliant at the node level. We just can't, in a distributed system, be asset compliant across the network because we need to lean into the fact that we are extremely performant. Mm-hmm. We want to accept and return data as quickly as possible. That's that trade-off for consistency, right? Eventual consistency allows us to be asset compliant at that node level, but we are eventually consistent across the cluster. Right. For listeners who want to learn more about multi-model databases, they can listen to one of our past episodes, which is episode 353, which goes into depth about multi-model databases. We'll move to the next section, which is around businesses wanting to transition to distributed data infrastructure model. And I appreciate it's specifically relevant, especially relevant for real-time domains. When What are some practical steps that businesses would want to look at or what are the best practices to be kept in mind when you plan the transition? I think one of the biggest things we see customers concerned with, they understand all of the benefits. They have accepted the idea, at least with our product, of eventual consistency. Obviously, the ones who don't use other products and we wholeheartedly recommend them. But the biggest thing is the lift involved and the fear and the entrenched, you know, uncertainty and job responsibilities, it's, it's really, we can architect the solution. It is institutional, you know, concern over all of the things we've talked about. So going through, for a large enterprise, the security audit, going through, you know, the pen test, going through, you know, looking at dependencies and software and running us through the tools of analysis. So can we survive the gauntlet of, you know, each enterprise's individual security requirements and teams? Can we explain the value effectively enough to the decision makers at a high level and then also turn around and explain at the lowest level to the actual infrastructure IT teams exactly what we need, why we need it, what the ports are, what the throughput is, when they their internal tooling needs to fire off an alert about something that's wrong. How do they understand that there are no external transactions coming in, but the database is still moving things around? 
they still see network traffic. Uh, that makes them nervous because they're used to, well, the, the transaction load peaks at noon every day and then it goes down. So it's really education is most of my job is going into organizations, helping them draw it out. They get what the graph looks like. They, they get what the schematic looks like. They get where the nodes are. They understand why we would you know, place applications where we would and why we would partition data the way we would and why we'd set up access controls the way we would. But they are nervous, understandably, about, you know, simply jumping off a system that works and that they continue to throw money at to vertically scale, i.e. add resources to serve, you know, a growing user base or a new requirement for lower latency. So they see the benefits, but there's challenges when you talk about, you know, moving from my current application stack, which might have, let's say, 100 moving parts, right? That's standard. We, we have tooling and systems and measurement, and, and we can sort of hold those in our mind. And we know every one of the 100 pieces and we get it. But if I want to be in 100 places around the planet, well, now I'm worried about 10,000 moving parts. And when I talk about the parts, I'm talking about the database. But you know, in an application stack, you've got the application layer, right? Maybe it's your API servers. And then you've got your real-time streaming service, your message queue, like a Kafka. And if you use, you know, like a MongoDB, traditionally you'll have a Redis cache sitting in front of it. And if I've got all of that to set up everywhere, it becomes a little daunting because one of the things we do is we we draw your existing infrastructure, your existing stack, and we say, if you want low latency, we can achieve it with all of the parts you have right now. Here's what it looks like. There's an awful lot of boxes on this page. And I'll lean into HarperDB product a little bit is, is what we've done is we realize the distributed infrastructure is complex and, and scary. And so we built an application layer on top of the database. So you can build your APIs, you can build your machine learning classification or recommendation engines there. You can even be, build machine learning models in it, long running processes like collecting sensor data. So your, your application layer is directly on top of the database. So there's not an over-the-air call or a, a connection or a driver that you need to use, which lowers latency, but also lowers complexity. And then the same real-time streaming mesh network that connects all of our nodes is capable of ingesting Kafka streams. It's capable of ingesting MQTT, MQTT protocol from you know mobile devices or mobile apps. So we built that in too. Sorry, what protocol was that? MQTT. Sorry, I'm not aware of it. Can you help explain oh. what it is? MQTT is a protocol, a PubSub protocol that has its own specific packet shape, but is a PubSub based model. So think a client that wants to use a little bit less data than sending a whole, you know, JSON object as a packet. MQTT is more efficient and it has built in logic around exactly once delivery or at least once delivery or at most once delivery. Okay. It's a communication protocol. It's a messaging protocol. And it's one of the many ways that people try to ingest and egress or subscribe, publish and or subscribe data into modern systems. And you have to accommodate that. So we built within our streaming engine because our data replication paradigm is PubSub. I can choose to have a table in Los Angeles publish to a table in London. Or I could choose not to. So in many ways, I don't have to move the data around all the time. It's not an equal copy everywhere. It's what data needs to be moved and what data doesn't. And we accommodate that. So if you think about like your traditional message queue, your traditional database, your traditional API servers, your traditional in-memory cache, like a Redis in front of a MongoDB, we built all of that into a single product specifically because we knew that this was going to be a complex undertaking and we wanted to overcome the objections, you know, of trying to manage 100,000 moving parts when we walked into an enterprise and said, distributed computing is your future and we're a database that talks to each other. Honestly, the reason we built the application layer on top of HarperDB was because we had a distributed database, we had, you know, message queue moving the messages around and we went into deployments, which were super focused on low latency our customers' API servers were, you know, they're in the cloud somewhere and we're like, okay, well, we definitely want to be in the same region and maybe even we'd like to be in the same availability zone, data center. Can we be in the same rack? How close can we get? And we realized that we weren't really in control of the latency. There was a gap between, you know, where the client connected and where 
the data live. So we couldn't guarantee, you know, an SLA in terms of latency because how close could we get? So we built a full function application layer on top of the database specifically because we wanted to lower latency. It turned out, you know, the way we built it with credit to the team, the care we put into the ergonomics and developer experience, it's been very, very easy for our customers to transition from their existing API or, you know, application infrastructure into, you know, transition those functions into our application layer. A, they do it because it's it's easy, but B, it's it, because it lowers latency. And certainly when we go into enterprise and we're, we're selling them the solution, we don't make anybody do anything. So we can start with your API servers just staying and making calls out to HarperDB and getting data just like they do with their existing database. That's super easy. But the migration plan, obviously, is to eventually put everything into, into a single platform so that it's much easier to sort of understand and manage. So from a migration perspective, start off with this security audit and then you know make sure that you know your entire dependency graph and a lot of time is spent on education. And if you have a product which gives you the entire platform, that makes things much easier. Absolutely. Looking ahead, what trends or developments do you see in the space? And how would they shape the organizations and the way they leverage data? I think the biggest trend is the idea that we want to build applications that are so performant that people don't even notice that you're loading data at all. It is a combination of user experience through UI and, and prefetching and being really, really intelligent about how you deliver data, no longer just initiating a call and waiting for it to be assembled and returned to you, but streaming that data back in chunks that can begin to have, you know, an immediate impact on the user experience while the rest of it fills in in the background. PubSub is huge. The idea that clients now connect permanently to a given server and they say, I want to know about this. And anytime anything changes in the database, I want you to push it to me. I don't want to pull you. I don't want to waste bandwidth. I don't want to waste the overhead. I want to connect once, do my handshake, my SSL handshake once, and then I just want to be here. And I want constant real-time updates, right? It's getting closer and closer to real-time, not just for apps that you know always sort of were real-time, but apps that polling seemed like a perfectly acceptable strategy three years ago. And now everybody's like, oh, it's pups up. That's better. And when you do that, there are considerations that have to be taken in terms of the load that holding open a socket for every single client, you know, brings up and you have to be able to understand how that affects your capacity. So what, even though we are distributing the load across multiple servers, the capacity of each server in a pub subsystem, even with persistent connections on a pub sub, when I am say persisting a query, which might have a user ID in there, that means I'm holding a little bit of RAM on that machine to look for records that affect my specific user or my specific query, right? A between these two numbers. And there might be 100,000 people connected to the server and none of them are asking for data between the same two numbers. So that's a RAM consideration. So how many of those sockets and how much work can I do to serve that? And does that number go down? Does it mean I need more servers? Does it need to mean I need to add resources to each server? And what is that balance? So it is absolutely an infrastructure and resource planning. And then obviously that plays directly into things like Kubernetes and containerized infrastructure where auto scaling happens and auto scaling for a distributed database. How is that achieved, right? I can add a new node automatically, but how do I get the data from, you know, a currently performing node into a new node that I just spun up to handle additional connections? And how do I do that in a way that responds to a peak in user behavior that might only last for 15 minutes, but it may be 10x what I'm used to? So how do you not fail in a really dynamic system when the level of traffic, the intensity of those transactions can change in a split second? And to be honest, one of the solutions that I think everybody's looking at, and you, you hear this across every database when you hear their CEOs speak in public is AI is probably going to have some role in that, right? The idea that 
I can spin things up and duplicate it and I can sort of fake it till I make it and bring records over. Distributed querying, the idea that yes, I have a new node, but I might actually be sourcing the data elsewhere until such time as the new node has a complete copy of all the data it needs to respond to requests autonomously. So there's lots of things that are really exciting as we go forward. Sounds great. We have covered a lot of ground here. Was there any, anything that I missed that you would like to mention, Jackson? I think I've said the word AI and machine learning lots today. And I can imagine a world where distributed data systems now that have multiple copies, whether it's partial or whole or sharded and are distributing queries, those sorts of systems are interesting, but I see a scale coming that is 10x, several orders of magnitude larger than what we have right now, because I've seen classification and recommendation engines that are so scary good. I've seen AI that is so incredibly competent because it has near instant access to every piece of data when it's training, which is an incredibly expensive process, and then local training or retraining of a model based on local data. So the idea that everybody is sort of leaning into AI is amazing. And I'm super interested to see how that affects, you know, what data infrastructure even looks like. Is it something completely different than the product we build? And I'm absolutely sure that it is. And I would challenge, you know, everybody who deals with data infrastructure to look at how data truly is accessed. What are those patterns? What's the human factor? But now what is the machine factor? How do you collect everything from so many disparate sources, not just the sensors that you own, but all of the other things in the world, including user behavior, server load, whatever it is, and sort of auto-generate a data fabric. That is the sort of thinking we need. And if you're dealing with data infrastructure in any way right now, and it's maybe the more monolithic architecture, begin to think about how you can optimize the shape of your data and the shape of your applications to get ready for that because, because it's coming. Right. If people want to find out more about what you're up to, where can they go to? Well, my company is HarperDB, and you can find us online at harperdb.io. And we have lots of blogs there. I occasionally write stuff. We have lots of uh, guest authors that come in that do tutorials and teach people how to build you know, applications inside distributed systems. We have a developer center that has all the resources you need to get started, and ultimately lots of templates for our applications that can help you bootstrap a distributed system quickly and easily. And that includes using HarperDB Cloud, which is our software as a service offering. So while you can always install HarperDB locally, and that is a single NPM command, you can also like spin up a free instance online today. Jackson, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure. This is Bridget Shamanath for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.